Hey, 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 good morning. Welcome to Redemption Church on Labor Day weekend. How's everybody doing for that? Excited. School's going to start, but it hasn't started yet, right? So it's exciting. The sun has still been shining. It's rained a little bit but the sun is still out. Summer is still going. And uh, we are so glad that you are here with us today. My name is Trent. I'm the worship pastor here and uh, glad you're with us this morning. Would you stand up as we start our time off and we're going to sing that hymn that we were just playing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And we put our hope and trust fully in him. Let's sing this together this morning. Jesus, help us trust in you in all that we do. Sing this out. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Oh, just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the save the Lord oh yeah oh how sweet will oh how sweet to trust in Jesus just to trust his cleansing blood and in sin faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood singing Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him more and more yes Jesus Jesus precious Trust 
we were uh, I was just kind of thinking and planning of, of coming here today and going through our songs. We're going to sing this song called uh, Oh Come to the Altar. And I was, I was reading this little article this week, and someone was talking about our worship on Sunday. And uh, what, what if our worship was more from the place of an altar than the place of a stage? And, you know, sometimes we, we think of, as we come here, even we call this a stage that we're on, right? And a stage kind of means almost like we're performing or something, too. And sometimes we get that mindset. But uh, worship is more of a place of an altar than a stage. And uh, today also we're going to be doing a communion today. And so just thinking through some of that too and preparing our hearts for that. As we kind of take this time and sing this song, let's make this a place of an altar. And a place of an altar a lot of times is sometimes when we come to God and we really like pour out our heart to Him or pour things to Him or ask Him for things. And I'd like to just maybe take a moment and think about those things. What is something that you might be needing from God or something that you might want to be laying at the foot of the cross, something that may be weighing you down, something that's just a heavy worry on you, or maybe it's some kind of sin that you just see, God, just again, I just, I bring this to you. So just take a moment, think about that. And as we sing this, would you just make this a place of an altar before God to meet him and allow him to do what he needs to in your life and to lay your life down, whatever it may be. Think of something just practical and lay that down at the foot of the cross as we sing this song.
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure sing this next little chorus just as a moment of surrender declaration that Jesus would take our lives and use them for him that we would live for him all the days of our life sing take my life God let it be all for you and for your glory take my life yeah let it be yours sing that again yeah, take my life and let it be, God, all for you, for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours again. Take my life, take my life and let it be all for you. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life, God, let it be yours. Let it be yours. Would you pray with me? Jesus, oh God, words that are easy to say but hard to live. God, would you truly take our lives let us live for you. Jesus, in light of what you have done for us, you gave your life for us. You shed your blood. You've given us forgiveness and life, Jesus. And we say thank you, God. We say help us, Jesus, to live for you. Throughout as we go off into a fall season for students that would be taken off to college or school and their classrooms, people getting back to work in places and coming back into the office. God, that we would live for you and be an example, God, to take your light to the world around us that needs you. Let our light shine brightly, Jesus, for you as you fill us up, God, with your forgiveness, with your love, God. Help us pour that out into the world around us, Jesus. We thank you so much, God, for all your love for us. We praise you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for singing this morning. You go ahead and take a seat. Well, good morning. It's great to be here with you again today, this first Sunday in September. My name is Ella Maddox, and um, we just have one announcement this week, which um, with the start of school in fall, MOPS is starting up, which is Mother of Preschoolers. And that's for all moms, um, kids preschool through five or six years old. They'll be meeting on Tuesdays, Tuesday evenings, and they're meeting without kids. Um, but then throughout the season, we'll have regular scheduled play dates and meetups during the day. But you can look on the app and um, find all the information to sign up and um, get the rest of the details. So today for our scripture reading, it's from Psalm 51, 16 through 17. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. May God bless the reading of his word.
people? Good morning. So good to be back in the Duval. I was actually over in Spokane this week. I was seeing my old mentor, number of friends. I know a number of people that live in Spokane watch online. So love you guys. Sorry I couldn't see all of you. But it's great to be back here today, back into our series that we're doing here toward the tail end of the summer. Uh, that's all about Dave's playlist, right? And, and what it is at its core is looking at these different songs that are windows into the soul. And one of the things I love about songs is that they are simple in what they capture, but they're not simplistic in what they reveal. It's like they probe deep. They kind of open up our psyche in such a way that they show us all the different ranges that we struggle with with life or with God or with faith or with failure. It's all sort of in that mix. And so that's why I like doing a series like this, because it just lets us be really honest about our own lives, honest about our own battles, and then how we take that to God in a worshipful or reflective or sometimes even a complaint sort of fashion. And today, man, today is a unique particular psalm because it grants access in a lot of ways to a soul in agony, a self-inflicted wound that's happened to create that agonizing soul, and really with that then kind of the way that they try to reconcile all of their, their challenges and their heartache. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the Psalm designated number 51 today, Psalm 51, that's the place we're going to camp. But as we get ready to go into that today, and we're going to just be diving right into it, I want to encourage you, if you uh, want to take notes, we have an app that has all of those notes. You can just fill in the blanks, follow along, have all the text right in front of you, and then save that to reflect on that at, at a later date. And I think we will when it comes to Psalm 51, because all of us have sin. All of us have failure. All of us do things in life where we just put our our face in our hands and we're just regretful for the things we've done. And this gives us a bit of a roadmap on how we navigate ownership and eventually from that completeness. And so we're going to look at all that today. So with that said, I want to go ahead and open with a word of prayer. If you would join me, I would love that. Let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus, I thank you that you came into this world because you wanted to save sinners, that you wanted to rescue us in our offense, our brokenness, our failure. Uh, it just it's, it's across the boards, little things, big things, all things combined. And I thank you that you so willingly and lovingly came. You took our offense. You lived, died, rose so that we could have life with you. And I pray that that's what we reflect on today. Even though we're in an Old Testament song that has Old Testament trappings, that we will realize you are the New Testament fulfillment of Old Testament promises. And from that, you give us a thorough and complete uh, forgiveness. And so, Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. It's in your good name we pray. Amen. All right, so Psalm 51, to feel the full weight of what's going on in that psalm, you actually need to, for a moment, eject from that section of the Bible, flip backwards a little bit, and go into the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11, because there you get sort of a behind the scenes of what's going on that led to the song that David writes. And when I go back and do that, I consider it like pulling a VH1. All right. So I don't I may remember the channel VH1. It still might exist out there in the real world. Okay. We got some people that dig music. All right. If you're not familiar with VH1, it's like MTV, but with a brain. All right. So it had like thoughtful documentaries. They would get into the depths of certain things. And one of the best shows they had on there was behind the music. And they might track a band and kind of how they came to be, or they would look like a one-hit wonder and how it happened, and you get like the full range of stuff. And so it'd be like interviewing the old band members, and it'd be like, yeah, I joined Danger Kitty after the first guitarist, like, I don't know, got married or something. You know, and you're like kind of finding out what happened. Like, we had this one-hit wonder. It was called like getting skunked, and the way it happened was we were out partying one night. We were wasted. Our drummer cockroach saw a cat, tried to kick it, didn't realize it was a skunked. And then we got skunked, and that's the name of the song now. You know, you're just like, these guys are burners, man. Um, but you would get the whole behind-the-scenes thing. And in the same way, that's kind of what we have in this section of Second Samuel chapter 11. It's kind of the behind-the-scenes of what's going on in the life of David that then stirs him eventually to record the song that we're going to learn from today. And so we got to go back in time, go back to the instant, and see what he was dealing with that is the catalyst then for Psalm 51. And so if you're taking notes this morning, it's the first thing in your notes behind the music, a sinful conspiracy. 
That's what was going to happen in his life. And it's one that you actually, most of you at least, are going to be familiar with the story, but we're going to walk through it anyway. So it starts in verse 1 of chapter 11. And it says, and in the spring of that year, when the kings normally go out to war, which I think is weird that there's like a season for war, you know, like, oh, we've been cooped up all winter. Let's go fight somebody, you know? And so it's like hockey season or something. David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites, and they destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So idleness is the devil's playground. You've heard of that. And where normally kings are going to go with their armies into battle, David's like, "Mm, I've done enough of that for a while. I'm going to lay back, chill, do things in my own pad, let you guys go fight for me. So that's exactly what he does. And it seems he's laying around, he's eating, he's drinking, he's doing whatever. And one late afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace and he looked over the city and he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was and he was told she is Bathsheba, particularly the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, now real quick about this, uh, that Uriah is a Hittite means he wasn't of national Jewish origin. He must have converted to this, or maybe his father or grandfather, whatever, they kind of came into this. So he still has a national identity in this non-Jewish space, but he's now a faithful Jewish follower, follows the God of Israel. That's who he is. More importantly, he's a man of courage and valor and renown, so much so that we see elsewhere in the Bible that he is one of David's mighty men. So originally it was a group of 37 dudes, eventually it grew to 80, but it's like a Navy SEAL rolled with a Secret Service dude, an FBI agent who actually can cook good food, like all in one. Like that's who he is. He's tough, he's driven, he's focused, and he's very, very loyal to David. In fact, David's mighty men go all the way back to David's predecessor when there was King Saul. King Saul didn't like David because he was a threat to being the future king, and Saul wants to punk David, and so David had these men that just rallied for him. And this is one of those dudes that just rallies to David, loves his king, right? He'll die for king and country, and so he is committed to his king. But now his king stands on his balcony checking out his wife, Right? So you begin to see how things are going. And it's weird that we call them peeping Toms. We should have called them peeping Davids from the start because that's who he is. Right? He's just peeping on this woman that is not his woman. And so it says, David then sent messengers to her. And he doesn't send messengers so they could have tea and scones and talk about the plight of a mighty man of valor that serves the king. No, it says, when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having, menstrual, having her menstrual period, which is a weird additive, but we'll see it in a minute. Then she returned home, and later Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, and she sent David a message saying, bun in the oven, dude, this is on you, right? And this is a pretty serious thing that's going on, right? And, and, and so to kind of understand that little additive about her, her menstrual cycle there, uh, basically what it's trying to communicate is her husband's gone, She's had her monthly cycle, which means he's not going to be the dad. It's not possible. The bath that she's taking on the rooftop is actually her ceremonial purification. So it says she's completed that cycle for the month. And then she's been with the king. And therefore, the fact that that's all true, it implicates David as the only possible option for the father. So David can't be say, hey, were you with somebody else? It can't be me, whatever else. It's just trying to airtight the story that David is going to be the one to blame. He is the one that's brought forth the this problem what you want to understand about this then when we start to pile up david's offenses that initially his offense is threefold right threefold first when you look at the ten commandments the the tenth is thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife but that's exactly what the king has done Another one of the commandments says, you shall not commit adultery, but that's exactly what he does. And adultery is a capital offense. In their world, their law, you do that, you must die. That is the the requirement for that kind of offense. And then the third thing that I think we have to just be honest about, and I know this might be a little uncomfortable, but what David actually engages in is basically a sexual assault. Right, because again, there's this power differential. So if this happened today, It would be like a CEO taking advantage of a lowly page or secretary. She can't say no. She can't resist. She can't refuse the king. He just gets what he wants from her. And so in that sense, it's 
borderline a rape, if not a rape, because she cannot have any retaliation for what's going on. And so basically, he's got two capital offenses on top of a covetous problem. So three sins total. It's like a hat trick of offense here. Well, David's like, I got to fix the problem. So he calls Uriah back from the battlefront. And he's basically doing this so that Uriah comes home and has a conjugal visit with his wife. That he goes and he goes to bed with his wife. And then from that, Uriah will think it's his child and everything is covered up. So Uriah comes back, but he doesn't want to actually even connect with his wife. So now David's sins are even more multiplying. He's conniving, he's deceiving, he's manipulating. But Uriah's a good dude. And so instead of going home, he sleeps on the king's porch, right? I'm here for you, my king. I'm I'm loyal to you. I'm going to fight and die for you if need be. And so David's like, man, this is not working out. So he actually brings Uriah in, gets him drunk. Here's another sin. Gets him drunk. He's like, now you're drunk. You should go home and see your wife. He's like, no, bro, I'm not going to do that. So David's like, ah, man, what do I do next? So he comes up with another cockamamie idea. He's like, I need Uriah to die. And so he comes up with this scheme to send Uriah into battle against their sworn enemy and then to pull back forces but leave Uriah out there so Uriah dies at the hands of his enemy. So again, the people that hate God don't love the people of God. Now you have the king of the people of God sending a man of God to be slain by people who are against God. It's, it's so sinister. So that's the plan. So David writes this, this command to do this, seals it, and he's like, I need a messenger Hey, Uriah, can you take this mail to the battlefront for me? So Uriah carries his own death warrant to the battlefront. It's opened, executed. He goes out. He dies in battle. And not just him. The text says that many soldiers also died with him that day. So now David has tons of blood on his hands. And you know what David's response is in light of getting the news that Uriah died, other soldiers died, the plan has been executed, you have this woman that's pregnant. His attitude is basically... Well, you win some, you lose some. It's just callous and hard and cold. Meanwhile, we see in the story that Bathsheba is mourning the death of her husband. She didn't want any of this. And David goes, well, I've already got seven wives. Let's add you as number eight. Right? So he is just self-consumed. If anything, there's times where I look at the life of David and I go, man, in the modern day sense, he'd be like a psychopath. Like just honestly, he just doesn't see what he's doing. It's just no guilt, no shame, no grief, no remorse for all of it, for taking advantage of a woman, for deception, adultery, multiple murders, coveting, and just raw indifference. He's a mess in the story. But God isn't indifferent. And so God raises up one who hears the voice of God, a man named Nathan, and Nathan shows up to tell David a fable, just like a, like a, just a simple story. And he says, King, I got to tell you this story. There's these two guys. There's one that's very rich and has all sorts of cattle and sheep. And then there's another guy that's super poor and all he has is one little lamb. And, and, and one day, Uh, The the rich guy's like, man, I'm going to have a big barbecue with a bunch of friends that are going to come over. But I need something to to feed them. I I don't want to use my own stuff. So he looks at the poor man. And the poor man with that one lamb where he's literally raised the lamb with his children. And the lamb has eaten from his plate and drank from his cup. And it says the, the poor man literally cares for the lamb like his own daughter. But the rich man takes the poor man's lamb, slaughters it, and serves it up as the barbecue for his friends. And so David hears that story and he loses his hypocritical freaking mind. He's like, I've got land and a shovel. Let's get that guy. We'll bury him in the back 100. Nobody will ever know, right? Like that's his space. He's so angry. He just can't believe somebody be so pitiless to a person with one simple little creature. So then Nathan says to David, you are that man. You're that rich dude with everything. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I give you your master's house and wives and kingdom of Israel and Judah. And if that hadn't been enough, I would have given you much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites, no less. And you stole his wife. 
This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I have caused your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your eyes, which by the way will be David's son. And it will be David's son who will go to bed with them in public view, which is meant to disgrace his father. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen in the open, in the sight of all Israel. And it's finally there that David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So, messy dude, right? He has sinned profoundly. His family and world will implode systemically. And thus he writes Psalm 51 vividly. And it begins with a sincere contrition. (coughs) Starting in verse 1. He says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion and it haunts me day and night. (coughs) Excuse me. I know that one. Like, I know that one where you're just like, man, I can't escape it. I can't avoid it. I'm so weighed down by it. That's kind of where he's at, man. doesn't matter what space he's in. It's just constantly before him. Now, a couple of things about this that I think are interesting. First of all, <clears throat> he appeals um, not to justice here necessarily, nor even to law. I wouldn't even say he appeals to the sacrificial system. Look at where he's going. God, I'm relying on your mercy. I'm re- re- relying on your, your loyalty and love. I need your compassion for this one. Right? I can't check all the boxes and it'd be okay. Because he's been merciless, he's been loveless, he's been selfish, but he knows that God is greater than his weaknesses, greater than his failures, and so he's going right to the top with this one. He's not going to the priest and saying, hey, let's put together like whatever the, the, the sacrificial system requires. He's like, man, I'm bypassing that right now. I gotta go to a higher authority. I've gotta go to God who can deal with my heart. And so he goes outside of legal prescription here. Because let's be clear. If David was like, I just got to do what the law says to make me right with God on this one, he would do two things. He would first go to the priest and say, all right, uh, what do I need to give for a sin offering? And they'd say, you need to do this and this and this. He's like, okay, I'm going to do that. The second thing he should do is demand his own execution. Because what he's done is actually worthy of death. The only way you can fulfill honoring God in the law is that David be executed. He, He doesn't really go down either one of those roads, it seems. If anything, he veers out of the law and throws himself simply on the grace of God. He goes, I just need more. I need you. I need you to step in and deal with me, change me, relieve me, and release me. See, I I, I love this whole thing because it does feel like a foreshadowing of Jesus. Like when we all come to Jesus, we don't come... And we're like, all right, what are all the things that I got to do in the prescription to, to make things right? It's like we just throw ourselves on his grace. Like you did for me what I can't do for myself. You died for my sins. I can't do that for me. I can't keep all the rules to be right with you. But you kept all the rules so that I can be right with you. And so I just trust you. Take me. That's really where David is going with this whole scene. And so he's not really going after forensic acquittal. He's just going after kind of this relational embrace with God because he feels the weight of his failure. And he knows only God can bring relief. That leads to a multifaceted confession for him. I say multifaceted because confession has bandwidth to it. I don't know if you realize that. One part of confession is acknowledging, like I've done wrong. Another part of confession is um, celebrating what is right. So this is why we say like Christians have confessions or creeds. They're acknowledging the right. But we also want to admit when we've been wrong. And David's going to do both. And so he says, against you, and this is this confession of wrong, against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. Now, in a certain sort of way, that's kind of true in the sense that um, ultimately God's law comes from God and David has violated a bunch of laws. And so only against God has he violated the law, but he's also violated his other wives, Bathsheba, Uriah, other soldiers, his family, and ultimately the nation. Like he's got all kinds of dirt on his hands. But he knows that only God himself can forgive the plethora of his injustices. And in that sense, he's like, I'm going just to you because you're the only one that can truly acquit me because I've been evil. 
He says in verse four, you'll be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment of my mother's conception or the time my mother conceived me, man, I was a wreck. Then in verses 14 and 15, he says, forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves Then I will be joyful and sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. See, I love this because where he had once been lustful and cruel and just selfish, now there is this sense of ownership and contrition and responsibility. He's just acknowledging wrongness. I think that's such an important facet for us. That when we go to God from the sake of relationship or in the space of relationship, what we're wanting to do is say, God, I'm with you. You said I've done it wrong. I've done it wrong. I'm not fighting you on that. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not going to challenge that. I am an an exact lock, stock, and barrel with you. I've done the wrong thing. And so he confesses his wrongness. But then he also confesses God's rightness. He goes, here's what I know about you, God. You delight in truth in the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Now he's going into this positive confessionary thing. And this verse is kind of tough. If you look at it in English translations, you could probably pull up any six, and all six are going to kind of word this a little bit differently. They're like, what's he getting at exactly? It seems what he's trying to say is, God, here's what I also want to celebrate and confess. That you love my purity both when it's public and when it's private. You want me to live not just from knowledge, but from heart. You want me to own truth, but in the sense of wisdom applied and lived out. I don't want to keep being a fool, and you don't want me to be a fool. I want to be wise, and I want to walk in your word in such a way that it makes wisdom kind of exude from my being and the decisions that I make. And so, God, I know what you want. Thus, verse 7, he says, purify me from my sins, literally descend me. Descend me, purge me, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Notice the conviction. Like, he knows in and himself he's got nothing, but he's like, man, God, you are faithful, you're true, you're secure, and I know as I come and do this, you will respond, because that's the God that you are. So he's like, man, unclutter my sinful longings, launder my soiled soul. Because I know that when I come and you do this, I will be whiter than the purest snow. See, I dig it because David knows that God is faithful to forgive. He's certain of that forgiveness. And that's really what he's longing for anyway. What he wants is completeness. Completeness. It's his longed for completeness that he hungers. Verse 8. Oh, give me back my joy again. For you have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Here's the thing about this, and I want to be really clear on. I've said this before, uh, because I'm all about honesty. Sin is fun. Sin is invigorating. Sin is a good time. Sin is that taboo thing that when you first go into it, man, it's nothing but a blast. But it's like living life on a high interest credit card, right? Pretty soon you max it out and you've got now debt and interest on that debt. And where it was fun and invigorating to be with another man's wife, it's all falling apart. And now the bill is due and there's interest involved and it's crushing. It's taken away all the joy, all the fun. And so now there's grief and regret and consequence. And so David, man, he's like, man, my soul is is wrecked. And I know my life will never be the same. My moment of gratification has led to a life of frustration. Because remember what God told Nathan, uh, David, your family will never go back to neutral after this. Your life, your kingdom It's forever changed. You will be forgiven, but there's going to be consequences that remain. And so David knows that, but he still knows that even in light of the consequence, God can still give him joy. And so he says, remove the shame, restore the joy, reclaim my heart. Thus he cries in verse 10, create in me, forge a fashion, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a loyal spirit within me. See, there's really kind of two profound requests that are buried in that. Give me a heart unblemished and give me a loyal 
loyalty undivided. Because that's where he's been. He's been divided in many different ways, right? And, and, and where he's at here in that request, again, every time I read Psalm 51, it just kind of resonates with me. Because like I said, I have certainly been in spaces in my life where I've just stepped in it. I've done something really, really ridiculous. And I'm so frustrated at myself, you know? Just like so deeply angry at what I've done. And I kept going, I, like, I'll, I'll be in my car and I'll just be like kind of hitting the dash. Like, why, 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 stupid, 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 dummy, you know, like that whole thing. And I actually believe that space is where we should start, right? We should be like so grieved about something stupid or dumb or sinful or foolish that we do that we're like, dummy, dummy, dummy. But that repetition will not heal the heart. In fact, if anything, it might even shackle your heart. And it, and it leaves you in a space of guilt and shame as opposed to what guilt and shame should lead to, which is relief and release and forgiveness, See, David wants his heart healed. He wants his life restored. He wants his brokenness fixed. And so he knows that the key to that is not just crucifying himself forever, but it's seeking the presence and power and preservation of God. And so then he says in verse 11, do not banish me from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, your rescue, and make me willing to obey you. Four requests are in there. Two are more in the negative, and then two are in the positive. The ones that are more in the negative are, don't leave me. Don't abandon me. Right? In the Old Testament period, the Holy Spirit would come and go from the kings. Right? This happened to Saul. He had the Spirit, and then the Spirit left, and Saul went crazy. And David's like, I've done stuff worse than Saul. Lord, do not take your spirit from me. More importantly, don't let your presence be abandoning me to myself. I do not want to be left to myself. So again, in the negative, he's saying, do not reject me. Please, that's kind of, he says, I don't want that. I can't bear the thought of that. He says, instead, restore to me joy. Make me willing. Give me a passion to do what you call me to do. See, I, I love that both are in play. He knows that he needs God's availability and he needs God's reinforcement. And so he's longing for that. He also knows in doing this, it's going to outfit him so that he might help others. And that's the next thing in your notes, a life of coaching. He's like, I, I want to get into the space because I think it'll be useful to that purpose. Now, I use the word coaching here because actually as a church, we use the word coaching when we talk about how we want to uh, execute our missional statement. Our missional statement is helping people believe life is better with Jesus. That's our mission. And we go, well, to do that, we want people to feel welcomed as they come in, valued for who they are, coached in the things of God, and then unleashed into the world as a missionary. That's kind of our heart. And see, we choose the word coaching because coaching has these two different components to it. One part is like pushing, but another part is praising. One part is saying, hey, we're going to be corrective, but another part is going to be inspiring. Good coaches do both. And David wants to be a good coach in his space. And so he's like, man, if you do this and if you restore me, verse 13, then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. He's like, man, I blew up my life. I blew up my family, I blew up everything. But God taught me and used me and shaped me through that process. I'm a big fan of this. Matter of fact, if you come to redemption for any length of time, I'm very transparent, right? I'm very open about my failures because I think failure is one of the most profound teaching tools and we don't share our failures enough with one another, right? In fact, recently I wrote an article for my blog that was perhaps one of my most catastrophic failures as a parent, right? Like how I utterly failed as having a gay son and being more afraid of Christian community than I was really trusting God and faith for what I was doing. And so I just kind of catalog my utter failure. I'm chalking it up as probably number one in my life. Nobody loves putting their dirt out on the internet. And the fact that it went sort of viral doesn't make you feel really great. Like, hey, now thousands of people have read my dirt. Right? But, but here's the thing, we learn from failure. We learn from mistake. We should be honest about those things so that we might teach. We might say, you know what? Learn from where I blew it. Learn where you can do better and seek the Lord in the process. Seek the Lord. 
And as you seek the Lord, realize he can heal in that process as well. This leads to David's core walk away. And this is so good, verse 16. He says, God, I know what you want. He says, you do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one, right? He says, you don't want a burnt offering. The sacrifice that you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. I love this because this is an Old Testament dude, right? Who writes an entire song about, I love the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, great, awesome, beautiful. I I can't stop thinking about the law of the Lord. But here he's like, man, I know even that is insufficient. What I know is that you don't want to sacrifice as much as you want me to be completely dependent on you. Here's the thing I'm going to tell you today. God doesn't want your strength. God wants your weakness. God God doesn't want your perfection. He wants your honesty about our lack of perfection. He doesn't want you white-knuckling religion. He, he, He wants you to step into that space that says, God, apart from your grace, I can't do anything. Paul gets into that whole thing, man. Paul was a stud, and God breaks him down. He's like, dude, you're, you're a little too studly-like. you got to realize that my strength is perfected in your weakness, not in your awesomeness, not in your perfect obedience. Because newsflash for all of us, man, our best day still bad. we got all kinds of things we don't even know about that are incomplete. That's why, hey, man, saved by grace is so powerful. And the more humble we are in that, as opposed to proud, the better off we are. Because, man, then we're going to depend on God a whole lot more. That means we're going to him and saying, God, here's my need. And here's my sin. And thank you for your grace, because I know that's what takes me forward. See, this is what David knows. And so he just says, God, I I know what you want in the end. You don't want my good works. You want my absolute loyalty and dependency on you every single moment of every single day. And so that's kind of where he lands. But then there's addendums to this song, and it's a closing request. It says in verse 18, look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices and offered in right spirit with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. This is a very weird conclusion to this song, and most scholars believe it was added far after David's life, right? So the Holy Spirit says, we're going to put a little added thing in here, and we're going to make a parallel. We're going to parallel the life of David with the life of the nation of Israel. Because after David was king, his son became king. After his son became king, the kingdom divided. And both the northern and southern kingdom were eventually wiped out by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. And everybody goes off to exile. And then eventually they come back to the city under Nehemiah and Ezra. And they begin to rebuild the walls. And it seems that this is written in that period. But they're making the parallel. And it's kind of a bookend. Because really, the actions of David started a series of dominoes that in essence led to the Babylonian captivity. And then they come back, and it's like, oh, let's make sure we learn from David. We learn from how when he failed, he quickly made himself right with God. When he blew it, he realized that what God truly seeks of his people isn't just rote rules and creedal ideas. He wants heart. He wants person. He wants commitment. He wants loyalty. He wants dependency. In other words, it kind of closes and says, in one sense, don't be a David. But in another very real sense, be very much a David. See, what I love about the story is one of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament is honestly a pretty terrible human being, at least at parts of his life. A man after God's own heart did things that by our standards would have put him in prison for the rest of his life, right? And yet, God still draws in. God still heals and binds up the broken. God forgives even those types of offenses. I think that's powerful. And then even more powerful is the fact that we then, as New Testament Christians, we don't put our stock in law or David. We put our stock in Christ who came and did what no one else could do. Offered to us what none of us could achieve. Promises us a forgiveness forgiveness that is far superior than anything even David could have envisioned in his life. And what's cool about today is today is Communion Sunday. And we're going to take communion here as a church in just a moment. But as we do, I want you to think about, again, the radical nature of the forgiveness that Christ offered. 
right? As he came, lived, died, rose to move us from death to life, right? To deal with all of our offense. And then in exchange, give us a life with God, rich, abundant, and full. This is why I say life is better with Jesus. When you're cleansed, forgiven, changed, moved, and motivated by him, life is better. Life is better for you and for those around you. It is. And so as we take communion, realize that what we're doing is remember the body and the blood as we're looking at what Jesus did to forgive us, to create in us a new heart, to take out our heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. That's what the Old Testament talks about. That's what Jesus accomplishes for us. And so right now, I'm gonna go ahead and pray, setting us up for communion, also setting maybe some of you up to say, I wanna follow Jesus. And so if you would join me by bowing your head and closing your eyes. I just want to start off by saying anybody that's watching online or maybe watch later, watches later this week or is in the room and you're like, man, I've got all kinds of baggage in my life, all sorts of regretful decision, and I'm not a Christian. Man, the first step for you is going to Jesus and saying, Jesus, forgive me of all of the things that I've ever done that are against you and against others. Forgive my sin. Step into my life. Make me whole. Renew my heart. Help me begin this journey with you. You make that your prayer and your words. Man, that's stepping over the line from death to life, from old to new. If you made that your prayer, we want to know about that. We have a little tile in our app. You could let us know through there. There'll be a number on the screen when your eyes open up. You could text us. Just let us know I just started to walk with Jesus today. Or I'll be out at the front door. Stop and say, hey, man, I made that my prayer. Would love to know that. For the rest of us, I know that we all have sins big and small, right? We have self-righteous religious sins. We have unrighteous immoral sins and everything in between. We are a very frail and faulty race. But there is forgiveness. There is refreshment. There is healing. And, And today, maybe just as you're getting ready for communion, it's just a moment of saying, God, I'm bringing this one before you. I know I've done this. I've been hiding it. I know I've done this. I've hurt people. I know I got to address this and I'm choosing not to. I'm being too proud about it, too hostile about it, too unloving about it, too whatever it is. Like just confess it. Just come to him and say, I acknowledge it. I agree with you that this is wrong and I agree with you that there is a way that is right. Man, he wants to restore. He wants to complete us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that um, we are so pocked full of mess and yet you love us. Thank you that you have taken all of those offenses away from us. You are faithful. May we be faithful to you in your name. Amen.
It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. Amazing love. Sing it out. In all I do, I honor you. So it says on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, he gave thanks, broke it and passed it out, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. later in the evening, took a cup of wine. He said, this is the new promise of love and loyalty, a covenant sealed by my blood, poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for your pledge of love and loyalty that says you will keep us even when we are faithless, unfaithful, and foolish. You have forgiven, you have sealed, and you will complete us. We thank you for so rich a grace. We're undeserving, but we're incredibly grateful. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we close out? Sing this song again. Start with this little chorus. It just cries out, Jesus, you are my king. We pledge our allegiance to him, the almighty God. Oh, you are my king. Jesus, you making it their prayer. I just want to encourage you to do that. Make this your prayer, if that's your prayer, that God would take your life and use it for his glory. Sing one more time. So take my life and let it be God all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours and yours alone. Lord. Yeah, take
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I hope you have a fantastic week, students, as you guys head out to school. Are you excited? <laughs> Parents are, yeah. School starting. Have a fabulous week. Enjoy the rest of summer. Spread God's hope, love, and joy to the world around you. Have a fantastic day, and we see you guys next week.